Hi, Internet. Matt Donner here, Peer of Mind, back with another breakdown. It's been a while. I am sorry. Been very, very busy. Um, but just the same, I'm back. Hopefully, you're excited about that. I am. I have something for you today. Uh, the beginning of what I hope will be a series because I think this record has an insane amount to teach us. Uh, the record is Adventure. The artist is Mattyon. Uh, it was released 2015, uh, so I'm a bit behind in getting to it, but it really doesn't matter because I think this record's going to last for a very long time. A um, couple of reasons for that, one of which is that the record actually plays like a record. It's an album. Each song tells a story. There seems to be a sequence to them. The first three cuts play like one. Hard to tell where he's a DJ, where he's a producer, where he's a performer. The lines are very blurry. Um, each song is pretty immaculately put together. The details are insane. It's a great record if you don't know it. Go back and listen again to it. A great list of guest singers, fantastic vocals, incredible songwriting. Um, and at the heart of everything that I do is to try to take popular music, um, electronic dance music sometimes, and uh, show you what lies underneath. Because when you know what lies underneath, you can kind of wrap it up in the sounds of the day, and you can pull from all of these other great artists who have something to show you or something to teach you. So the underlying structure in Isometric, the opening track, really has two things to show us. Um, one of which, of course, is the chord progression, which is very, very dense. Um, there's a couple of moves in there that are very interesting. We're going to talk about extended chords. We're going to talk about uh, seventh chords, dominant chords in particular, and various ways to imply dominance but not actually do dominance. Um, but the other thing is something that I think really has nothing to do with the DAW or chords or theory. And the function is titles matter. The name of the song is isometric, and if you look it up, it has two definitions, one of which is that it has to do with muscles when you're doing exercise. That's not us. The other definition is of equal measure. And I took a gander at the track, and I've put together my own version of it. I think I'm pretty close. You never know. So, Maddie, if you're checking it out, let me know how I did. Just saying. The idea here, I think, is that there are a couple of places where he applies isometric change to the song. And so the song and the title go hand in hand, and I think that that helps translate what the statement is of the artist. And if you're working in your DAW and across the top it just says untitled, and you know that's you, you really have no idea what you're making. It's a good idea to title early, and that just helps keep you in the mood, put your mindset in the right spot when you're looking at the title and it doesn't say untitled, it says my new awesome song, or whatever the mood is, I think that matters. So we're going to look at those two things. And I guess without further ado, here goes. Um, quick heads up, um, the way the song is laid out, let me actually get rid of my sense of returns here. Uh, we've got a big fat group full of all of the synths. We've got a little ghost kick over here. We've got the originals, which YouTube won't let me play. And I've got this piano part, which breaks down the chords into very simple element. The, it's simple element, so we can maybe take a little bit of a deeper look there. Um, so, if you're not familiar with the song, go check out the record. First track, first song, isometric. I'm doing the first half today. I'm going to come up and do the second half afterwards because uh, there's so much in the first half that it's I couldn't fit it all into one video. Um, in addition, I think it's important to see the first one fully broken down and then the second one fully broken down so that you can see that he didn't just copy and paste. He made r pretty radical changes. And the key ingredient here is setting up to go back to the beginning. First things first, let's go through it, okay? I do want to point out a couple of things. One of the first places where I'm, where I think he did it and then I'm trying to copy in terms of taking the word isometric and applying it to the song is tempo. And you can see here, uh, you can see that this first scene is called G major 103. Uh, what I've done is I, I took the clip, I took the original clip broke it up into sections, tried to warp it and beat it and get a sense of what the tempo was. Came up with 105, my ears said 103 was better, so I went with 103. But the idea is that the song slowly increases in tempo in equal measure. And rough math gave me the, about seven BPM per measure. I'm not sure that's correct. This is how I played it out. Now I'm doing it in the session view, so each scene is gonna keep at a fixed tempo and you'll hear the tempo jump up in stages. I'll show you how to make that smooth in the arrangement view in a second. 
So isometric 103 plus 7 gets you 110, plus 7 gets you 117, 124, 131, 138, 145, etc. So it's a pretty big tempo shift across the spectrum. Um, let's dig into the first one. Sounds like this. Butterflies and lollipops and, you know, old Peanuts commercials. It's G major, and if I pull up a piano for everyone here, you will see what I'm doing. Or really, what he's doing. So G major, I'll go down an octave. It's not what he plays. He actually starts on the fifth. It's very lullaby. As we've heard and seen in other of my videos, when you're doing melodies, melodies in major, particularly things around the one, two, three, one, two, three, work really, really well. So his first is just G major, spelled out like this. Not like that, like this. Now, in and of itself, that's not terribly interesting. It gets interesting as it goes from one chord to the next, which is F major. So I'll play number one. And then number two. Now, what's weird about this, and also really awesome about this, is that you hear motion that goes in two directions at the same time. The bass goes from G to F, but you know you hear the notes that also go up. And so if you notice, the first chord ends on the major third. The second chord goes up to the five, and you get this little mini motion of... You get a divergent motion between the notes. The chord goes lower, but the melody goes higher. That continues to the next chord, which is E-flat major seven. E-flat, major, E-flat again, major seven. So if I just track the motion, you have... which gives you a little melodic motion of G, F. So it's beautiful. You get this sort of, this kind of spreading and widening and growing. It feels like it's growing. Even though the chords are getting lower, the upper harmonies are getting higher. So this continues from one. Now, in and of itself, that's enough of a progression to write a full song. Um, it's major, and then it's mixolydian, and then it's aeolian. You could go back and forth. Which should sound familiar to you. Um, the motion is called the Picardy third when you have the flat six major and then the seven, and then the one major. Should sound familiar, it sounds like Seal's Kiss from a Rose on a Grave, sounds like Dead Mouse Some Chords, um, Pearl Jam's um, Black, I think is in the middle, I think it did it in Jeremy as well. Um, it's a very, very common progression. So that's the progression we're seeing in the first three chords. Now, where things get a little funky is in the fourth chord. Um, and what Madian's done here is something I, I don't usually recommend people do when you're starting out, but as you get more and more comfortable with uh, theory, with chords, particularly seventh chords, um, you, you, I don't usually suggest people invert their bass, which means if you have a G chord up here, you should be playing G down here. Now if you play G inverted here, you still play G down here, and then G inverted again, you still play G down here. But what he's doing is effectively the same as doing G major, or he doesn't have the G in the bass, he has the major third in the bass. And in some cases it's a third, in some cases it's the two, in some cases it's the seven or the nine. So he starts inverting the bass, which immediately gives you complexity. So what I have here starts with G major, moves to F major, E flat major seven, Now, as you can see, if I just solo this, and let's leave that floating. F down low, 
and then an F and a G. And then... with... actually makes it F minor or E flat major 7. I have it listed as E flat major 7. With the F again, add 9. Let me do it this way. That's the upper half. It's basically E flat major, then a 7, then a 1 again, then a 9. You get this. In the bass, F. Now the chord is here. He's playing the 9 in the bass makes it sound like some kind of weird F chord, but it's really an E flat major 7 with the 9 in the bass. And so why would he do that? Because the chord before it is E flat major 7. The chord after it is still E flat major 7, but now there's an F in the bass. He does it to create mini motion, mini melodic motion. So the bass goes from here to here. And you'll see a little bit later, or actually he's already done that, at the very beginning. There's this melodic motion. So this is kind of a running theme all the way through. So we're on the fourth chord. We've got G major, F major, E flat major 7, E flat major 7, add 9, F in the bass, and then the kicker. gas face. Okay, this guy is worth digging into. The chord as I have it, again I'm not certain I'm 100% correct, but I have it as A minor 7 flat 5. This is A minor 7, but as a flat 5. So it's, uh, it's the 7 chord in the key of B flat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The seven chord is always diminished in a major, and it's always minor seven flat five in sevenths. But here's what's fucked up about this. Can I say that? Mm -hmm. Here's what's messed up about that. You always do a minor seven flat five in the seventh, but it's also serving a different function. The function of chords is not always what the chord is. You can do a two chord, but it's serving as a one chord, or serving as a five, or serving as something else, or functioning. In this case, it's actually functioning like F dominant. Add nine. And dominance is kind of the root of blues, and salsa, and jazz, and Latin music. Um, comes to us from Bach, way through uh, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, the classicalists. Um, so this dominant, chord. It's a major triad with a flat 7 on top. And you can see this A diminished is in the middle of F dominant and it's also in the middle of A flat minor 7 flat 5. Now why choose such an obviously tense and awkward chord? And why choose a chord here that's actually serving here? Why do that? And the answer is dominance. Dominant chords love to fall to the one. And so in this case, if we're in F dominant, it's going to fall down to a new one. Now, the dominant always falls by a perfect fifth, which in this case is B flat. And that's where we're headed. So we have E flat major 7. Maybe add 9. Then, E flat major 7 with an F in the bass. And now, to our crazy A, minor 7 flat 5. And it's going to move as the leading tone right up to there. You can feel it just wants to go somewhere. And where's it going to go? It's going to go here. Or, this way, just to play it an octave higher. So what have we learned? We've learned that chords don't have to stand still. Just having G, F, E flat major, F, G, could have been enough. 
No, that's not enough. So, one, two, three, inverted to create tension. Minor seven flat five as dominant so that you can fall a fifth to B flat. We started in the key of G major, and now we're in the key of B flat major. That is a bizarre jump, and yet he makes it sound very smooth. Starting in major, moving mixolydian, then going aeolian, staying aeolian, using dominance to say, I want to go somewhere else, and he goes here. And then from here, last chord, F major 9, inverted bass. F major, 9, F, then G. Except the G doesn't play up here, I play it here. So we have this chord. And instead of playing F in the bass, or the 9 in the bass as he did before, now he's playing the major 3rd in the bass. It's kind of hanging there, waiting to circle around and do something. Now the truth is, we're at F, and so where we started was G. So he made one big fat loop here, actually here, 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 to go right back, and that's where we'll pick it up next time. A lot of chords. There's a lot going on. If this didn't make sense to you, hit stop, rewind, watch it through, watch it through, watch it through. Ask me questions. You can always reach out to me through the mentorship network. I am available. But I want to show you the isometric piece more than anything else. You heard the tempo speeding up as we go from here. And let me actually get out of the piano, get back into the other thing. So clearly you hear the speed up. Now, I'm in the session view. Not a lot of people like the session view. I don't know why, I think it's the coolest thing on the planet. But it's not very smooth, right? In the session view, every scene is fixed to this tempo because that's the tempo I've chosen. So what I could do and what I ended up doing was hitting this session record button, or excuse me, the arrangement record button and then I performed scene one, then scene two, then scene three, then scene four, and I brought it over to the arrangement view. And then, as a matter of fact, let me do that for you guys. Let me highlight everything, blow it out, do this again. So, start at the beginning, and I'm going to go ahead and perform it, and then I want to show you what happens where isometric shows up again. Because I did it in the tempo, but I did it in a couple of other places too. So here we go. The master track in Ableton does allow you to take a look at many things. Usually it's fixed to volume, but if you click here, you can go to song tempo. You can see the stair stepping. I don't think that's what he did. I think in fact, what he did, I'm at 145. I'm actually gonna add another seven, bring it to 152. And then you could simply highlight all of these. Make sure to put one at the beginning or else it won't work. Control click, cut envelope, and now you have an isometric curve of tempo. And if I hit this button, the arrangement takes over. This is what it sounds like nice and smooth.
here just continues to speed up all the way to the end. Now, for fun, I think he did something else in there. I didn't copy it perfectly, I don't think. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate the point. Um, I have all of these little guys which are doing uh, Native Instruments retro machines to give it that old analog Stranger Things sound. But just for fun, I put in this Massive sound. Now, you'll notice that in Massive, I have automated the filter, the decay level, and the release time. And each of them are behaving in stair-stepped but isometric fashion. Also going up seven every time. So if I highlight all of this and we cut the envelope, you'll see the exact same thing. That is the release time. Do the decay level. In fact, let's put that up as well. Get rid of you and highlights and cut envelope. And one more time, filter. Uh, let's actually knock that up a little bit also, just for fun. And cut envelope. Ooh, a little straggler. So if I pull up Massive, you can see these red items here. That shows you that they've been automated. And after you smooth out the curves, if I pull up Massive, and uh, let's take a look actually at the, uh, yeah, sure, let's look at the decay level. So now if I pull up Massive, and I'm on envelope four, which is converting, or at least being applied to the amplifier, which means you're gonna hear this on the overall volume. If we then go back to, thank you, here, this is the curve, straggler. Just watch as the decay level adjusts itself isometrically. So, titles matter. Because isometric motion is in this track. I've put it in a couple of places in this one massive synth. He's put it at minimum in the tempo. Chords can get very complicated very quickly. But the results are beautiful. If you're curious about this song, want to see more, want to hear more, by all means, reach out to me, Matt at Um I teach the Producing and Arranging 101 class online, 101, 110, and 210 here at Ground Campus. Uh, and I'm also available for private lessons through the Pyramind Mentorship Network. It's great to be back, folks. Uh, thank you, as always, for being so kind to me. Um, please keep it up. We could always use more positivity out there in the world. So thank you again from Matt and from all of us at Pyramind. We love you and we really appreciate it. Until then, enjoy your adventure. If you're a music producer, subscribe to our channel and stay up to date on the latest Pyramind tutorial videos, track breakdowns, elite sessions, and more. Visit us at pyramind.com.